Thank you uh, very much for coming uh, this evening, and I hope you get something useful out of it. Um, I uh, hope to provide some uh, thought-provoking material about sleep tonight, uh, and we hope uh, that you will consider this information to improve your health and the health of uh, others. So uh, the objectives this evening are to review some basic facts about sleep, uh, secondly, to focus on aspects of sleep particular to Parkinson's disease and to review some basic tips to improve sleep quality. So why should we think about uh, sleep? Uh, sleep problems are common and can be serious. Sleep problems impact our sense of uh, well-being and quality of life. Uh, sleep has uh, largely been neglected and uh, that's unfortunate because simple treatments can make significant differences uh, to patients and their families. So I want to give you an overview of normal sleep, just so you have some of the vocabulary and uh, perhaps learn a bit. Um, sleep is a behavior. It's a reversible behavior of unresponsiveness to the environment. It's important for the brain and the body. Uh, you lie down, you're quiet, and your eyes are closed, and that's how we can tell animals are sleeping. In humans, we can define various sleep stages based on uh, three characteristics. The brain waves, the EEG, your eye movements, and your muscle tone. So if we know those three things, we can figure out what stage of sleep you're in. And if you have a sleep uh, study, a polysomnogram, a many sleep graph, uh, we can track other physiological variables of interest over time, like your breathing, your blood oxygen, your heart, uh, and muscle activity. And you can find interesting relationships at various uh, time scales. So I wanted to uh, just walk you through some of the basic sleep stages just so you were familiar with them. Uh, the waking state uh, the EEG is characterized by a, a rhythm called alpha. Alpha is uh, the first EEG rhythm ever described, so that's how it got the alpha uh, label. Your eyes are uh, looking around. There are rapid eye movements, and you, you will have prominent blinking eye movements. And your muscle tone is pretty high. And this is a, a graph here uh, from the, the sleep study just to show you what waking looks like. Uh, and that's about 30 seconds of waking there. Now as you start to get bored with my talk, and uh, it's been a long day, and you start to, to doze off, your, your EEG slows down a little bit. And um, the eyes uh, also start to drift back and forth uh, in, in the head. And so you can see this in, in people who are sleepy, their, their eyes start to kind of rove. And your muscle tone starts to drop. And so uh, if you look in the audience and people are starting to drop and suddenly wake up, uh, you can pick that out. That, that's a marker of uh, light sleep. In uh, a sleep study, if I see a lot of stage N1 sleep, it's a marker for very light uh, sleep, lousy sleep. It's a transitional state on the way to, to deeper, more restorative, physiologically useful sleep. And if you have a sleep disorder that's waking somebody up, they have to start all over again in N1. So we see a lot of N1. Uh, we spend about half of the night in stage N2 sleep. And this has got a, a very uh, arbitrary uh, definition based on an EEG pattern called a K-complex. And it's just this big uh, giant waveform here in the middle of the, the page. And we see spindles, which are uh, very fast uh, EEG waveforms. So those markers just define stage N2 sleep. Your eyes stop moving at that point, but your muscle tone starts to go a little lower. This is what's really important, uh, physiologically relevant, useful. Uh, stage N3 sleep. We used to have a, a stage three and four sleep, but we now just lump it together and call it N3. So there's some other synonyms for this, slow wave sleep or delta sleep. But basically the EEG is very slow and very high voltage. Your eyes are still, your muscle tone is quite low. 
This is restorative, restful, rejuvenating, energizing, recharging kind of sleep. Uh, if you are sleep deprived, this is what your brain will want to pay back first. So this is uh, a marker of uh, uh, restorative sleep. The physiology of sleep, um, your other body systems look like they're at rest as well. Your heart rate slows down, breathing becomes very regular. So th this looks like a restorative state. It's not rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep, which occurs about 90 minutes after you, you start to go to sleep. Rapid eye movement sleep has got an EEG that's very similar to wakefulness. It's a little slower. You obviously have rapid eye movements. Uh, the most important thing uh, neurologically about REM sleep is that you're essentially paralyzed uh, in REM sleep. And of course, in Parkinson's, there's a, a condition where uh, people lose the ability to paralyze themselves in REM sleep and they can enact their dreams, which can be problematic. Uh, this is the, uh, the classical dreaming state, so most people have uh, dreams in, in REM sleep. So over the course of the night, we progress through those sleep stages, N1, 2, 3, and REM, in a 90-minute cycle. And with each cycle, uh, we have uh, a paying back of our, our deep sleep first, and then a little bit of REM sleep. And as you've paid off some of that sleep debt, you have less and less of the deep N3 sleep and more and more REM. So this is a, a graph called a, a hypnogram, a graph of the sleep stages over time. And here's bedtime and wake time. Uh, and so we're looking at a whole night here. The green is N2 and this uh, blue is N3 and then REM. So you can see this 90 minute cycle, lots of deep sleep and a little bit of REM. And with each cycle, less and less deep sleep and more and more REM. So that's why we're more likely to remember a dream uh, in the early morning. So as a distribution over the whole night, we spend about 5% of the night normally in this light uh, transitional state called N1, about half the night in N2, about a fifth or 20% in uh, N3, the restorative, restful, rejuvenating kind of state, and about a quarter of the night in REM. So that's a pretty normal uh, distribution. So how much sleep do we need? Well, that changes over our lives, newborns need about 18 hours of sleep and have spent about half of that time in dreaming sleep. Most adolescents need about 10 hours of sleep and most adults need about 8 hours. The most important cause of excessive daytime sleepiness in our population isn't sleep apnea or narcolepsy, it's behavior, it's insufficient sleep. So most people uh, need about eight hours of sleep, but for a large part of our working lives, often work uh, or sleep less than, than eight hours. So that's the number one cause of daytime sleepiness. The, um, uh, there's a myth that the elderly need less sleep as they get older. And uh, basically, uh, we have 90-year-old patients in the sleep laboratory who have eight hours of sleep and get 20% slow wave and 25% REM. So it, it's not uh, true that, that you need less sleep with, with age. You need about the same amount. It's unfortunate that medical conditions or conditions like Parkinson's, medications can interfere with sleep and so often get less sleep at night, uh, but it's not, uh, not normal. So I wanted to start off with some very basic uh, uh, sleep behaviors or things that, that you can do uh, to help improve your sleep and then we'll talk about some sleep disorders. So in terms of uh, sleep hygiene or good sleep behaviors, it's a good idea to keep regular sleep and wake times. Your body learns uh, to expect sleep at certain times and becomes conditioned to, to have it at that point and so it's easier to establish uh, good quality sleep uh, by keeping regular sleep and wake times. This is also important, as you know, uh, in the timing of medications in Parkinson's to keep that kind of regular routine. We use the, the bedroom for sleep and sex only. Uh, we tell people to not spend time in bed if they're not sleepy. So uh, rather than stay in bed and then uh, 
learn to associate the bed with not sleeping, it's better to, to be out of bed if you're not, not drowsy. If you're trying to, to get a good chunk of sleep at night, we recommend that people avoid napping in the afternoon. There's nothing really wrong with napping, uh, but if you're trying to have a, a solid uh, chunk of sleep in the, in the night hours, it's harder to do if you've paid off some of that sleep debt in the afternoon. So we generally recommend that people avoid napping if they're trying to keep the night sleep solid. I tell people to avoid the snooze button on the alarm clock uh, because uh, what that does is it just causes you to wake up, hit the alarm, drift off again, and then you, you're in this kind of lighter state than you would be if you had just slept as much as you had intended and set the alarm for when you really want to get up. It feels good because you're, you're in, a, in a light uh, uh, sleep that, that's similar to, to wakefulness, but, but it's not uh, as restful as actually getting that, that sleep time. In terms of other things uh, that are uh, simple, avoiding caffeine uh, if uh, you're trying to, uh, to sleep better at night. On the other hand, caffeine can be useful to help increase alertness in the day. So it depends on, on what the, the problem is that you have. We tell people to avoid alcohol. Uh, alcohol is a bit deceptive. People fall asleep faster, uh, but then the sleep that follows is more disrupted and fragmented, so the quality of sleep is not as good. We uh, suggest that people eliminate smoking for, for many reasons, but uh, that can, can be disruptive to sleep. Eating a heavy meal, a fatty meal before bedtime can aggravate uh, gastroesophageal reflux and that can fragment sleep. We tell people to try and time their medications in a sensible way. Alerting medication should be taken in the morning and sedating medication should be taken in the evening to kind of preserve a natural uh, circadian rhythm. So if you look at the list of medications that you might be on, it's worth thinking about what's the best time to take these medications, um, remembering that alerting medications are better in the morning, sedating medications at night. I recommend that people exercise, and uh, uh, in particular, exercise early in the day. Again, this reinforces a natural circadian rhythm or tendency. It's not great to exercise just before bedtime because your body releases fight or flight hormones that can interfere with sleep. So that can actually be disruptive to night's sleep. So it's better to get the exercise in the early morning. I also tell people to avoid working at the computer uh, at close distance uh, to their eyes, uh, particularly at night, because the light from the computer screen is a, a signal, a light signal to the brain to wake up. So that's why roosters crow in the morning. So uh, you, you don't want to be sending a, a signal to your brain to wake up when it's time for bed. So I tell people, you know, do your computer work earlier in the day uh, and, and read on paper at night. In terms of uh, having a comfortable environment, you want a room that's dark. Uh, you want a room that's quiet. Some people benefit from uh, a white noise machine to block out uh, extraneous uh, noises in the environment and have a comfortable temperature. Generally people sleep better with it a little cooler. Uh, have a comfortable bed um, but not a water bed. Uh, that can be uh, quite disruptive. Take a hot bath before bed. The, the process of cooling off just before bed helps facilitate sleep and learn to relax. So some people relax in different ways but uh, uh, there are, um, it's not always uh, obvious, so some people meditate or listen to relaxing music, but you know, finding that way to kind of initiate the sleep process in a consistent manner is a good thing. I tell people to turn the clock away from the bed. If they're waking up in the night and they're you know, reporting, oh, I woke up at 2 and 2.30 and 3 and 4 and I'm going to be a wreck tomorrow, that's actually... That's a, that's a bad thing to do because looking at that uh, and realizing you're not sleeping is a stress in and of itself. It causes your body to shoot out fight or flight hormones which disrupt the sleep process. So it's better to just turn the clock away from the bed and set the alarm for when you want to get up in the morning. And uh, if you're worried about missing that alarm, set another. Um, keep a list of worries outside the bedroom. So um, 
that's a, a two-part thing. First of all, it helps you figure out what the major concerns are right now rather than having free-floating anxiety, which is the worst kind of anxiety, uh, to, to kind of list out what, what the major problems are that you're facing and a tentative plan. You can't solve your problems in life completely by doing that, but it allows you to kind of figure out what you're going to do as the next step and also symbolically keep it outside the bedroom so that when these thoughts come to your mind, you, you just say, you know, that's for worrying in the day. It's not for worrying at night. Sleeping pills are uh, not a long-term solution for most people. And so we try to avoid uh, uh, starting uh, sleeping pills if at all possible. Uh, good sleep habits uh, may be uh, particularly important to those with insomnia. So those are some simple things that, that everybody can do. Now I'm going to talk about some specific sleep disorders. Um, and when I see a patient with uh, a sleep problem, it, it usually boils down to one of three problems. They're awake during sleep time. They have insomnia or something's interrupting their sleep. They're asleep during wake time. They have excessive daytime sleepiness or they're, they're tired or they have an unusual behavior in sleep. So it's important to kind of figure out what category of sleep problem applies to you. One thing I find very helpful and something you can do to help relay this information to your doctor is to keep a sleep diary. And uh, basically just take a calendar and write down when you went to bed, when you got up, you know, um, your exercise, caffeine use, um, symptoms from your Parkinson's, etc medication timing to help figure out uh, patterns and so you can see patterns on on uh, day by day uh, scale if you track these things over time so keeping track of uh, sleep and wake time and your sleepiness on a, on a calendar can be often very helpful so there are a number of uh, sleep disorders there's a, uh, a ton of them uh, but uh, the major categories of sleep problems that we see are Insomnia, so difficulty initiating and maintaining sleep. Sleep breathing disorders, things like sleep apnea. Hypersomnias of central origin, uh, as a fancy name for things like narcolepsy. And uh, the uh, problem in narcolepsy is a, a new neurotransmitter that we've recently found called a rexin or hypocretin. And that neurotransmitter is also impaired in advanced Parkinson's disease. So many of the patients with advanced Parkinson's disease have a, a comparable degree of sleepiness to those with, with the disorder narcolepsy. Circadian rhythm problems uh, can uh, uh, be seen frequently in jet lag and shift work. Parasomnias are unusual sleep behaviors, and we'll talk about some of those in a minute, like the REM sleep behavior disorder. And sleep-related movement disorders, things like restless legs and par uh, periodic limb movements of sleep are uh, particularly common. But there are a number of other sleep uh, disorders associated with various medical or psychiatric conditions. So in terms of the conditions where you're awake during sleep time, uh, I think of it basically in terms of difficulties initiating or maintaining sleep. If there are difficulties initiating sleep, one of the big things to look for is restless leg syndrome because it's particularly common uh, in the general population and slightly more common in Parkinson's disease. Uh, we look at sleep habits like we discussed earlier and think about the timing of medications, in particular making sure if we're using sedating medications we use them at night if possible. In terms of maintaining sleep, one of the big problems is that of obstructive sleep apnea, which is surprisingly common in the general population, and uh, intrinsic disorders of sleep that we see in Parkinson's related to changes in the neurotransmitters that control uh, sleep and wake state as well as movement. Now, finally, uh, we, we always try to optimize uh, Parkinson's medications and obtain control over motor symptoms uh, because that uh, in and of itself can disrupt uh, sleep. If people have a problem with being asleep during wake time, that is daytime sleepiness, obstructive sleep apnea should be considered uh, and other forms of sleep disordered breathing. So 
uh, for example, in the related condition, multiple system atrophy, uh, people can have a problem uh, called strider, where they have quite labored respirations in sleep, and that is an important condition to identify and treat. The uh, difficulty breathing at night can fragment sleep and then produce daytime sleepiness. So daytime sleepiness is common in Parkinson's disease, and uh, some medications we use for the management of Parkinson's can contribute. Uh, things like dopaminergic uh, drugs. Stimulant medications can be helpful uh, sometimes in uh, sleepiness seen in Parkinson's disease. So we talked about some unusual behaviors in sleep. Uh, briefly, we described the REM sleep behavior disorder, where the ability to paralyze ourselves in REM sleep is lost, and then there's an emergence of motor symptoms. We often see that these patients have violent uh, dream enacting behavior. So they, you know, if they dream they're being chased, they'll, they'll move and run. If they dream they're hitting, they might swing their arm out. The important thing about this condition is that it may come years before Parkinson's disease is clinically obvious. So it's an important clue uh, to changes in the brain, and there's a lot of research going into figuring out how REM sleep behavior disorder might uh, give us an early window into managing uh, Parkinson's disease with neuroprotective drugs, for example. Periodic limb movements of sleep are uh, generally regular kicking movements. They occur about every 30 seconds, roughly. And uh, they can range from very small uh, movements to, to quite vigorous uh, leg movements. This uh, is associated with the restless leg syndrome. So most people who have an uncomfortable feeling in their legs that they feel they've got to shake or kick or move that gets better with movement, a lot of those patients with restless legs will have kicking limb movements in sleep as well. There are many uh, uh, treatments available for restless legs. Dopamine drugs actually help treat restless legs, so a lot of uh, uh, restless legs in Parkinson's is already managed with dopamine agonists or, or Cinemet. Uh, but we also look for other underlying or treatable contributors, things like B12 deficiency, and iron deficiency. So for really refractory restless legs, sometimes uh, ensuring that iron is appropriately supplemented can uh, make a huge difference. And we often use dopaminergic drugs for, for treatment of restless legs, even outside of Parkinson's disease. So in terms of sleep apnea, um, this is a condition with significant um, um, morbidity and mortality. Sleep apnea is associated with increased uh, risk of high blood pressure and even stroke. And uh, people who have sleep apnea have a higher incidence of traffic accidents uh, because they're sleepier that gets better and returns to the population baseline with treatment. This was a, a picture of a, a patient who was c driving to see me the first morning, first appointment. And so this happened before he was able to be treated. So it was a very vivid reminder to me that it's a pretty significant uh, problem. In terms of uh, breathing problems in sleep, you might have apneas where there's a, a stopping of breathing for 10 seconds, or you might have a hypopnea where there's a reduction in breathing, or respiratory event-related arousals, which is a bunch of mumbo-jumbo for milder uh, forms of, of sleep breathing like snoring. And all of these can fragment uh, and interrupt sleep. So there might not be a significant cardiovascular problem the blood oxygen might not dip, uh, but it can still fragment sleep and be a significant uh, contributor to daytime sleepiness. So in terms of treatments for obstructive sleep apnea, we have a, a number of options. Certainly weight loss for overweight patients. Sleeping on your side is often a very helpful uh, thing to do. So a very practical thing is to get a t-shirt with a pocket in it, put a tennis ball in the pocket, and wear the t-shirt backwards. <laughs> that way, if you roll on your back, it'll be uncomfortable and you'll, you'll stay on your side. And so that'll help, help prevent people from uh, uh, getting into trouble while they're on their back. One of the most uh, uh, common treatments is uh, continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP. It's a mask that patients wear over their nose uh, attached to a blower. 
and uh, basically there's a tube that connects the two things. So there's a forced air into the mask, into the airway. And that just holds the airway open so that it doesn't collapse down on itself. And uh, it, it can be very helpful uh, for some patients. Uh, other patients uh, can benefit from a dental appliance, uh, which is custom made to open up the back of the airway uh, a, a little bit. And in, in serious, severe cases, uh, even a surgical correction of uh, upper airway uh, structures can be considered, but that's pretty rare. This is just an example of, of a, a sleep study that, that we did where half the night was looking and seeing what the problem was and half the night was treating. And uh, at the beginning of the night, there's a lot of light, fragmented, lousy sleep, and the blood oxygen is zigzagging, dropping, actually quite dangerously low. And then about here, we put on the treatment, and immediately the brain pays back that deep sleep it's been craving, and the blood oxygen comes up. And if you get a response like this, patients often feel like they're walking out of a fog, and they've, they've forgotten how, how good it, it feels to sleep properly. Of course, this can disrupt the bed partner, too. Uh, this can lead to the spousal arousal syndrome. <laughs> Not the good kind. And uh, this was a, an interesting study where they looked at 10 couples in a sleep laboratory. And uh, they found that treating one patient's snoring gave the bed partner an extra hour of sleep. So snoring has a, a, an, an impact on the patient, but also on the bed partner. So that's definitely important for caretakers. Uh, for women, uh, menopause uh, is uh, a risk factor for developing sleep apnea. So typically, uh, the textbooks say that, that sleep apnea is more common in men, but uh, with menopause, uh, sleep disordered breathing goes up significantly and is probably greatly underdiagnosed in uh, women. Uh, mild sleep disordered breathing as well may impair alertness and attention, mood, and quality of life. And as I said before, the elderly do not need less sleep with time. So it's always good to think, you know, is there a reason for it? In terms of narcolepsy, I mentioned before the orexin or hypocretin peptide is sick in narcolepsy and is also impaired in uh, Parkinson's. So there, there is a, a distinct relation Narcolepsy typically shows up in younger uh, persons first, but it's a lifelong problem. It's about 1 in 2,000 people, so it's not that uncommon. It's not as common as Parkinson's, uh, but uh, it is, it's definitely relatively frequent. And people are sleepy, and they might have loss of muscle tone with emotional stimuli, so with a, a joke or with a, a sense of anger. Uh, they may become weak in the knees and actually fall down. They may have sleep onset hallucinations or wake in the middle of the night and be unable to move, have sleep paralysis. And many patients with uh, Parkinson's report these types of symptoms, although cataplexy is really more specific for narcolepsy. We use a test called a, a multiple sleep latency test to quantify sleepiness. And uh, basically, it's a nap test. Uh, patients uh, spend in the lab uh, uh, the full day at 9, 11, 1, and 3. In our lab, we let patients try and fall asleep in about 20 minutes. And we rec record how quickly they fall asleep and whether they go into dreaming sleep. And this tells us about the degree of their sleep tendency. And it might suggest uh, that certain medications might be helpful for their management. Some of the treatments for this include strategic napping. So just simply timing naps, if it's consistent with uh, uh, their work or other activities, can be very helpful. Uh, medications to reduce sleepiness. Uh, so we mentioned before uh, stimulants or medications like stimulants, such as modafinil, uh, can be quite helpful for counteracting that degree of sleepiness. And uh, for narcolepsy, we have to also consider medications to treat this loss of muscle tone with emotional stimuli. So we said in terms of treatment of excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, just some other things to consider. You want to make sure that there's adequate sleep. So I mentioned before the number one cause of daytime sleepiness is insufficient sleep. So you want to make sure you're getting approximately eight hours of sleep. 
We want to make sure any apnea is treated and avoid sedating medications, in particular trying to avoid so-called sleeping pills if at all possible. If sedating medications are required, then we try and time that before bed so it makes sense in terms of the circadian pattern of sleep and alertness. And we use alerting medications uh, when uh, appropriate. And it's important to remember that, that you shouldn't drive if you're falling asleep inappropriately. So uh, that can be a, a severe consequence. In terms of abnormal uh, behaviors in sleep, that's called a parasomnia. And uh, we group the parasomnias according to which sleep stage they occur out of. And so there's two kind of major categories of, of sleep uh, uh, parasomnias. The slow wave sleep arousals, which is typically in children, uh, night terrors, uh, sleepwalking, confusional arousals uh, that they, they grow out of over time. More common, much more common in Parkinson's, uh, the REM sleep behavior disorder. Uh, which is associated with Parkinson's disease, as well as Lewy body uh, dementia. Now, um, slow-wave sleep arousals, like sleepwalking, tend to occur in younger people, uh, and older people are more likely to have REM-related arousals. Slow-wave sleep, N3 sleep, usually occurs in the first third of the night, uh, but REM sleep behavior disorder is more likely to occur in the last third of the night because there's more REM sleep. Usually, uh, patients are very hard to wake out of slow-wave sleep arousals, but they usually wake quite quickly out of REM sleep behavior and are often able to tell you an associated dream. I dreamed I was running or, or swinging my arm out. And the important thing about identifying this, besides it being an early window into the biology of Parkinson's disease for research, is that it's treatable. And so I've had many patients where uh, they're uh, violent dream enacting behavior was problematic at home and we've been able to keep patients in their home by by treating them often with a very very tiny dose of a medication called clonazepam. Some other simple things to uh, consider if there's a violent sleep behavior is make sure the room is safe. Uh, make sure that there are no there's no furniture with a pointed corner or uh, Oh, you don't want to keep your uh, knife collection uh, in the bedroom. Uh, you have padded uh, side rails uh, sometimes. Uh, having patients sleep in the middle of a large bed can often be uh, sufficient. Make sure that uh, apnea is not a factor or other sleep disorders. And I mentioned the, the, the first treatment is clonazepam at a very tiny dose. So I'll just mention one circadian uh, rhythm problem, and uh, that's called uh, advanced sleep phase syndrome. So if you look in families, it's very interesting to see there are often night owls and morning larks, and it, it tends to run in families. And uh, it's really quite amazing, but every cell in your body has a clock, uh, a molecular clock that cycles through a 24-hour rhythm. And slight changes in that molecular clock, just a simple, simple genetic change, can, can shift your clock by up to four hours. So your preference for when you go to bed or, or wake uh, can shift dramatically based on this simple genetic information. So it's uh, really quite remarkable that such a complex behavior can be uh, controlled by genetics like this. And uh, we've identified about 10 uh, genes that can control some of these uh, patterns of behavior. We're gonna find lots more in our lives in terms of mood disorders in sleep, um, one of the most uh, uh, robust biological findings in depression is that patients have a short REM latency. So we said normally the non-REM REM cycle is about 90 minutes. And so in depression, that's very short. And uh, all the treatments, things like uh, medications uh, or even ECT, uh, prolong the REM latency and, and are associated with recovery. So it's a useful uh, biomarker of mood problems. Many medications have effects on sleep and wake control as well. So drugs like antihistamines uh, make you drowsy. Stimulant medications and caffeine increase alertness. Uh, benzodiazepines, or so-called sleeping pills, actually reduce deep sleep. They get rid of slow-wave sleep, which is that restorative restful state. And so that's why 
uh, when we look in population studies of the elderly, patients who are on uh, sleeping pills like that are more likely to have falls and accidents. So we, we spend a lot of time trying to find behavioral ways to manage uh, sleeplessness, make sure other sleep disorders are addressed so that patients don't uh, have to have some of the side effects associated with some of these medications. Antidepressant medications tend to reduce REM sleep. That doesn't seem to be as problematic. So you can lose a lot of REM sleep and it doesn't affect your brain in such a bad way. Alcohol, uh, we mentioned before, hastens sleep onset, so people sometimes get into a pattern of using it to induce sleep, but the problem is the sleep that follows is often very fragmented and uh, not restful. So some clues uh, uh, to a sleep disorder, things, you've got some of these red flags you might want to discuss with your doctor. Um, do you get a restless feeling in your legs at night before falling asleep? It's relieved by shaking or kicking or moving. That might suggest the restless leg syndrome, and there, there are a number of treatments for that. Does it take you longer uh, than 20 minutes to fall asleep? That might be a sign of a problem. Do you snore loudly? Um, that's definitely a, a concern for sleep apnea. Unusual behaviors in your sleep, or violent or dangerous, should definitely be investigated. If your bed partner sleeps poorly, it's worth thinking about their sleep and making sure that gets treated because that could be impacting you as well. Do you wake up many times throughout the night? If you wake up once or twice, that's normal. But if you're waking up every hour on the hour, there's probably something intrinsically abnormal about the sleep, and it's often sleep breathing problems. Um, and then are you falling asleep in inappropriate settings? Uh, so when you're trying to maintain alertness, and that can be a sign of excessive daytime sleepiness that may warrant treatment. There's a scale called the Epworth sleepiness scale, which you may want to uh, look up on the internet sometime or try out yourself, but it asks how likely you are to doze off or fall asleep in a variety of settings. And if you go through this and you kind of say, if I'm sitting and reading, I would never doze off, and watching TV, there's a slight chance, you can add this up and uh, get a total score and then figure out if you're kind of within the normal range or not. So that's called the Epworth sleepiness scale. Um, so some simple things uh, that I mentioned earlier, I'm just going to repeat again to, to highlight. Simple things that you can do, try to get seven to nine hours of sleep. Most people need about eight hours of sleep. Try to get regular sleep and wake times. Avoid large meals, caffeine, and alcohol or fluids several hours before bedtime. Exercise prior to bedtime, preferably earlier in the day. Get light exposure in the day. As I mentioned before, light is a big trigger to your circadian system. And uh, if you have a very dark room, or, and we have this problem in Canada because we have a lot less uh, light, um, uh, you, can, you can not have sufficient light to properly entrain your, your biological clock. So I always encourage people to get lots of light exposure in the morning. Get outside in the morning to get that to get exercise, and then you've got the, the light stimulus and the exercise stimulus to help entrain a normal circadian rhythm. Keep your bedroom cool, dark, and quiet. Uh, some patients have told me that they find satin sheets uh, or satin pajamas easier to move around in at night, so that's a very practical thing uh, as well. Avoid naps in the day if you're trying to consolidate your sleep at night. Avoid using the snooze button on your alarm clock. Try not to do computer work uh, before bedtime, surf the internet or uh, that sort of thing because that light stimulus helps keep people awake, uh, which is not what you want just before bed. Uh, turn the clock away from the bed if you find you're looking at it frequently because that just enforces a vicious cycle. Um, keep a list of worries outside the bedroom. Find ways to relax or meditate. Uh, bed rails or a trapeze bar over the bed can sometimes help if you're uncomfortable, shifting position, etc. A bedside commode is another very practical thing that can help if uh, there's a lot of getting up in the night to use the washroom. So in summary, sleep problems can be uh, serious and are particularly common. Uh, oftentimes very simple interventions can make a big deal of difference to patients and their families. Uh, sleep hygiene is an important first step and everybody needs to do that even if they've got a sleep disorder. If sleep is still a problem after you've addressed sleep hygiene, 
then talk with your doctor. So I'll just mention quickly, I'm at Sunnybrook Hospital, and our vision uh, is to provide the best neurological sleep, patient care, teaching, and research. We have a, a nice group there. We've been uh, working as a research-based laboratory since 2004, and we're trying to, uh, to open this up. Uh, we operate as a, a multidisciplinary group, and uh, we're here to help. So for people living in the area, if they're having trouble with sleep, you know, just have your, your family doctor refer to, to Sunnybrook Sleep Lab, and somebody in our group will give you a thoughtful assessment and try and help out if you're stuck. So that's, uh, that's at Sunnybrook. We usually see patients and talk to them first and figure out if a sleep study is even needed. Uh, oftentimes it's not. You just have to you know, plan out the timing of medications or, or these sorts of things. So it's, it's helpful to sit down and go through these issues in detail. Okay, so that's uh, the end of my presentation, and that's my 45 minutes. So thanks very much for uh, the attentive uh, listening, and write down your questions, and we'll pick them up, and we'll go through some of them after the break. Thanks very much. So we have a stack, and we'll just uh, go through them as best we can and see where it takes us. So question one, I... I have been addicted to sleeping pills and can't fall asleep without them. Is there any hope for me? I can only uh, sleep six hours, whereas I always required eight hours sleep prior to Parkinson's disease. So um, in terms of um, reducing sleep, sleeping pills, um, one of the most important things is to address the factors that we outlined uh, earlier and also to... Uh, seek a consultation with a sleep specialist uh, to, to do this. I can get almost everybody off of sleeping pills, but sometimes it takes a while. You don't want to stop suddenly, and so there's often a kind of a tapering process. So it can take a year or two to kind of taper things off. One helpful thing is to, um, you know, review some books on, uh, on sleep habits, uh, books like Peter Howery's um, um, book, no More Sleepless Nights is available at, at Indigo or the library. It's a pretty helpful one. That's H-A-U-R-I. Oh, so the next question says, can you recommend a pillow or other device uh, that will hold your head in the proper position? And um, I, I basically, you know, just find pillows and bunch them up and tie them up and whatever you need to, to do it. I don't think you have to spend extra money to get something like that. Um, we mentioned the, the tennis ball trick with a t-shirt for staying off your back. In general, sleeping on your back is not good because that aggravates apnea. Sleeping on your belly isn't great either because your neck gets twisted. And so it can be hard on the, on the cervical spine. Uh, so generally sleeping on your side is the best. And if you had to pick one side to sleep on, it would be your left side down uh, because uh, that's where uh, uh, sleep uh, reflux tends to be less. Um, some people with cardiac problems find it hard to sleep on their left side, uh, but uh, if you can sleep on your left side, that's often the way to go. What do you recommend uh, if I have difficulty falling asleep due to excessive uh, buildup of saliva? And the, the answer to that is some medications uh, can uh, reduce... Um, uh, saliva production, so you want to talk with your doctor about that. Some of the medications that, that block uh, some anticholinergic drugs uh, can, can block uh, saliva, but the problem is that can have some adverse effects on thinking, uh, so, so you'd want to be careful about that. Another option is uh, sometimes even Botox uh, in, uh, can be uh, considered, so that'd be something to, to think about. Please address uh, loss of bladder control and sleeplessness. Which comes first? Can't sleep due to bladder or can't sleep so get up to the toilet? That's a really good question uh, because uh, um, clearly uh, people who have uh, urological problems, uh, prostatic hypertrophy, can have more frequent nocturia. That means going to pee at night. And uh, uh, clearly a urological assessment would be required Urological with a U, not with an N. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing we see in sleep, though, is sometimes for people who have really bad nocturia, it's actually related to a sleep problem. And so 
quite commonly, uh, people who wake up frequently from obstructive sleep apnea might be unaware that they have uh, sleep breathing problems and then they wake up and their bladder feels kind of full and they got to go. Uh, but uh, when we treat their uh, uh, sleep breathing problem with uh, CPAP, for example, the nocturia is reduced significantly. So sometimes it's not as obvious as you might think. It's not you know, clearly a urological problem. It may actually be a sleep problem. So, so I think you have to consider both. Please address uh, narcolepsy, falling asleep while eating breakfast and lunch and dinner. Well, th that, that degree of sleepiness is a significant degree of sleepiness if you're falling asleep eating. And so I think that that's a, a clear red flag that the, the degree of sleepiness is a problem. And that's on the order or range of narcolepsy. And as we mentioned, sometimes in Parkinson's, the degree of sleepiness is quite comparable because the same neurotransmitters in the brain are affected. So, uh, so definitely an assessment of daytime sleepiness and, and treatment of that, often with uh, a stimulant-like medication, could, could be helpful. Okay, uh, next question. Um, had trouble sleeping due to RLS. Went on to Mirapex, but felt worse with other symptoms. Um, uh, most people do pretty well with Mirapex, so that's uh, Premapexol, uh, so that's surprising. Um, one of the things you'd want to make sure is that there isn't another underlying contributor to restless legs, things like iron deficiency or B12 deficiency or blood glucose problems, things like that. Uh, is clonazepam a long-term strategy, good long-term strategy? Um, for restless legs, that wouldn't be my first choice. I would, I would try and find... Uh, Another option, um, is trazodone a good therapy? I, I, I think that is uh, not specifically for RLS, restless legs, but in general, it's a, it's a pretty decent sleep uh, medication. Uh, I mean, we don't use sleep medications often, but uh, uh, if you're looking at treating a depression and sleeplessness, uh, that is a good option. So that, that's a drug that we use sometimes in, in the clinic. Um, Another question here. Uh, I do not have delusions or hallucinations during nighttime sleep, but have had little snatches of sleep throughout the day, uh, most less than a minute in length. I have a, a little dream or a vignette which disappears immediately uh, on returning to the waking state. Uh, no medications involved. Uh, ongoing for the past 11 or 12 years. And so this is a lot like uh, narcolepsy. So uh, we said normally it takes about 90 minutes to go into REM sleep from, from sleep onset to, to REM. Uh, in narcolepsy, patients uh, go into REM sleep quickly. And so they have sleep onset hallucinations. They, they have a little dream. And so this is probably a marker of, of uh, significant daytime sleepiness. And... Uh, and these little little images are probably uh, little dreamlike states that intrude into wakefulness. So the way to address that is to improve alertness. So um, that could be many of the, the strategies we discussed earlier, but also uh, medications to improve alertness uh, might be helpful. Uh, and sometimes we even use medications to suppress REM sleep because uh, 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 REM is associated with the, the dreaming state. So. So taking uh, some, some medications like some antidepressants can actually suppress REM. So that's an interesting question. Um, the next one. I wake up every night around 3 or between 3 and 4 and cannot get back to sleep. Uh, I seem to function since I do not nap during the day and never feel tired. I, I don't think that's a worry. It depends a bit on when you go to sleep. I mean, if you go to bed quite early... Um, you know, three, getting up at three or four, you know, if you're going to bed at seven, uh, five and four, you're getting nine hours. So, so kind of depends a bit on the, the timing of sleep, but uh, waking up around three or four in the morning is pretty not uncommon. That's a, a, there's kind of a natural tendency to kind of uh, arouse around that time. Um, the other uh, factor here is that um, the sleep at the beginning of the night is the most intense and uh, your brain pays back the sleep first, so it craves deep sleep, and you get a lot of sleep early on. So if you wake up later in the night, it's harder to return to sleep because you don't have that same drive 
the sleep debt is not there, so you're not as, uh, you, you don't require it as much. So if you don't feel tired in the day, I, I wouldn't worry about it. I, I don't think it's a, a significant problem. Uh, another question. Um, I'm a very active person and sleep reasonably well. However, as soon as I sit down to read or watch TV, I fall asleep. Um, certainly, different activities will uh, induce uh, levels of arousal. So in, a, in an active scenario where you're talking to somebody or standing up, uh, I mean, alertness is, is more likely to, to remain. Uh, in a passive setting, sitting, watching television, not a lot of sound, not a lot of stimulation, not a lot of movement. Uh, people are more prone to fall asleep. That, that's just, that's natural. Um, in more, you know, significant cases, if, it, if it's becoming problematic, uh, then it could be a, a, a sign of uh, an underlying disorder. But, but uh, many people will doze off in uh, passive settings, and certainly more, more than in, in, in active activities. How about gravel to, to help sleep? Uh, or melatonin. So gravel uh, can aggravate the restless leg syndrome. So that, that's one problem with gravel. Uh, melatonin, um, melatonin does work. There have been studies on uh, blind individuals and uh, normally your circadian clock is, is paced by, by light. So if you do not have sight, then you have to find another way of resetting the, the biological clock. And so they've actually done Good studies um, in blind children, actually, and have shown that they can reset the clock with melatonin. But melatonin is really a small effect uh, compared to the effect of bright light. So rather than use melatonin uh, uh, to initiate sleep, I suggest get bright light in the morning to help uh, stimulate alertness in the day, and then sleep will follow uh, better at night. Um, okay. What are some remedies to treat Parkinson's patients who experience acting out their dreams while sleeping, boxing, swimming, shooting, basketball, etc.? So uh, the, uh, the first thing is to make sure that there is uh, not, not sleep disorder breathing or a sleep apnea that's contributing to that. And many times a, a small dose of clonazepam uh, at uh, bedtime will help, uh, help uh, those activities abate. Uh, how does someone reduce loud snoring without using mechanical devices? Um, well, weight loss uh, would be one thing. Uh, avoiding sedative medications and alcohol. Uh, that relaxes the airway, so, so people tend to have more uh, sleep-disordered breathing in that situation. Uh, and um, th those would be some, some examples. Some people have uh, prominent postnasal drip. And uh, a nasal steroid uh, type medication can help there. Um, so those are some, some things that jump to mind. Question, if you uh, don't recall your dreams, does that not indicate a possible problem with the REM cycle? And um, recalling dreams is not necessarily a good or bad thing. Uh, so for example, I'll have patients uh, that, that don't dream, and that's a good thing because they've got solid sleep. On the other hand, I'll have patients who have lots of dreams, and, and that might be uh, a, uh, a good thing because they're now getting REM sleep because they never had REM sleep before. So it's very hard to tell whether um, uh, the, the presence or absence of dreams is uh, good or bad, but it is helpful uh, if you introduce a treatment and you induce a change in that pattern. So if you know, for example, somebody doesn't have dreams, and then you, you start a treatment, and then they say, I start dreaming. Well, then you know that it, it's helpful. Um, similarly, people who wake up a lot out of REM might have a lot of dreams, so maybe their apnea is waking them up out of REM a lot. And then we treat them, and they say, my dreams went away. And that's actually a good thing as well, because what you've done there is you've reduced the arousals from, from REM sleep. So it's not so much whether it's there or not, uh, but in terms of if you introduce a treatment, sometimes that'll give you a clue that, that it's done the right thing. Uh, inability to fall asleep can be a result of stress or worry. Is there anything you can do assuming that reduction in the stress level is impossible? Um, so, so again, um, keeping a, uh, everybody has stress in their lives. Um, keeping a, a symbolic list outside the bedroom, it, it sounds like a very simple uh, trick, it, and it can be very helpful. It, it, it's a chance to um, 
uh, to, to draw up some tentative plans or, or solutions. And keeping it outside the bedroom just reminds you symbolically that, you know, uh, bed is for sleep time. It's not for uh, ruminating or going over these things again. Similarly, learning uh, relaxation techniques, uh, meditation, things like that uh, can help uh, reduce that. And then in severe anxiety uh, situations, um, a, a, a therapist might, might be uh, a helpful uh, consideration. You know, some people use uh, other techniques like deep breathing, uh, progressive muscle relaxation. Um, exercise in the day uh, is uh, a, a great way to uh, be more relaxed throughout the day. Um, is there a correlation between people who sleepwalk as children and adults who develop Parkinson's? And the answer is no. Uh, my daughter has night terrors for a few years, uh, from age 2 to 8. How likely is she to get Parkinson's when she's older? Uh, no more than the general population. So um, I don't think uh, sleepwalking is... Sleepwalking is very common in children, and uh, Parkinson's disease is relatively rare. Uh, so, so, um, so I don't think sleepwalking in kids is a, is a marker at all. What are solutions to restless legs, medications and non-medications? Uh, well, non-medication first, uh, ensuring you get adequate sleep time and avoiding caffeine are two of the, the, the easiest things to consider. Uh, Medication-wise, uh, we often use uh, low-dose dopaminergic uh, agonists. Uh, medications like Pramipexol uh, are often very helpful. Um, uh, I take a quarter milligram of Ativan for anxiety. Comment on whether or not you think this blocks restorative stage. If so, what do you suggest? So a quarter milligram of Ativan is a, quite a small dose. Um, it probably does reduce slow wave, but probably not that much. Um, in terms of uh, uh, anxiety disorders, that's one situation where sometimes you need uh, uh, a benzodiazepine type medication. So, so there may not be uh, much that, that can be done about that. Uh, and certainly, uh, small, smaller doses better. Um, another question, when's the best time to take an antidepressant? And uh, that depends on the type of antidepressant. So uh, a stimulating medication like Prozac should be taken in the morning. So some, some antidepressants are stimulating. So Prozac in the morning. In the contrast, some antidepressants are sedating. So medications like Trazodone are better to take at night. Uh, so it really depends on the, on the category. Uh, okay. Um, let's see if there's a... That's similar to one I already answered, so I'll just skip over that. Answer that one. Which is better, a firm or soft mattress? And, uh, well, I think there's different strokes for different folks. Uh, but, uh, you know, reasonably firm is probably easier to get in and out of. Uh, but, uh, but you want it to be comfortable. So I think everybody has different, different tastes in that regard. See if there's another one here. Answered that. Uh, leave a dopa four times a day, two at a time. Uh, sleep after the pills and wake up one or two hours later cannot go back to sleep, uh, have done all the sleep hygiene suggestions. Um, so one of, the, one of the questions here, I would think, is uh, sometimes uh, levodopa can, can be sedating, and so people can have uh, naps in the day. Uh, if you're trying to consolidate uh, sleep at night, uh, avoiding naps in the day as best possible is helpful. So uh, being active, uh, exercising, getting out, getting bright light exposure in the daytime uh, might be a helpful thing. And the exercise is probably helpful as well. Um, so that's, that's an idea there. 
does having a shower before bed have the same effect as a bath? Yes. And, and it's basically the, it's not the heat, uh, it's the cooling process. So uh, the cooling of the extremities is a, a trigger in the brain to induce sleep. So that's why, you know, typically people recommended a hot bath because once you get out, you start to cool off and then fall asleep faster. So that's, uh, that's that. You can do that with a shower or a bath. It doesn't matter. Um, what impact does depression have on sleep? Well, that's a good question. I, I think of it the other way around. Uh, what uh, impact does sleep loss have on mood? And so uh, certainly many of the symptoms of depression and uh, sleepiness uh, overlap. You're tired, you feel run down, you have low energy, lousy mood. That happens in depression. It also happens in, in uh, sleep disorders. So I think addressing both is, is important. So some people clearly have mood disorders. Some people clearly have sleepiness and there's a whole bunch of people in the middle. So I think uh, addressing uh, uh, sleep factors is, is what I spend a lot of time doing and, and my psychiatry colleagues will send me patients who you know, they've treated for depression with standard medications and, and they're still, uh, you know, fatigued, feeling tired, run down, and, and oftentimes there's a, there's a sleep disorder there. Um, I also mentioned uh, uh, briefly that the, the timing of REM sleep uh, in, uh, in a sleep study can tell you about uh, uh, depressive symptoms. So that's uh, it's an interesting relation there. Um, Finally, do late night snacks help or hinder sleep? I think if uh, people are hungry, they're not going to sleep well. Uh, but uh, uh, definitely avoiding heavy meals or fatty foods before bed is important because that will aggravate uh, gastroesophageal reflux. So that's, uh, that's my answer to that. I'm sticking to it. Um, my husband is afraid of getting into deep sleep because he worries he won't make it to the washroom. Um, he does not want a commode. Well, that's, that is uh, a problem. Um, there may not be an easy answer uh, for that other than uh, uh, careful urologic assessment, making sure there aren't a lot of fluids before bedtime, and... Um, ensuring that sleep is uh, appropriately treated. Another question, I'm not quite sure. Uh, they've, they've written Cinemet, Aero, Seroquel, Aero Sleep Connections. And um, Cinemet is a dopamine drug. Seroquel is a dopamine blocking drug. Um, and both can induce sleep. Um, but uh, I don't know exactly what else they, people were getting at with that question. And then I've got, is it normal for people to sleep with their mouth open or closed? Uh, some people, uh, uh, most people sleep with their mouth closed, some open. If uh, the mouth is open, that may suggest there's some airway, upper airway problem. There's difficulty breathing through the nose. Uh, so a deviated septum or uh, polyps or uh, uh, nasal congestion uh, may be uh, a problem there. And uh, people, if they sleep with their mouth open, can get a quite a dry mouth. What about reading my Kobo in bed before sleeping? I find it satisfying. So so the the sleep routine, reading before bed, it's a good thing uh, to, to facilitate sleep. The Kobo doesn't actually have a lot of light uh, exposure from it. The, the technology they have in their electronic ink is is good but uh, some of these e-readers with bright light you, you definitely want to turn it down to to bare minimum uh, and uh, if you find that it's disruptive there you, you can measure that this actually does impact sleep so so uh, so if that's a you know if there's a question of insomnia it might be worth switching to, to good old paper um, question um, Um, you do not recommend uh, sleeping pills, yet I started, I think, oxazepam uh, 45 minutes after my bedtime dose of Cinemet. 
and I uh, sleep about six and a half to seven and a half hours. Um, over the long period of taking this uh, sedative, sedative medication, what would be the long-term negative effects of uh, taking this low dose? Um, again, it's, um, you know, if there's a way to do it non-medical, I would do that. Um, you know, finding a, a sleep behavior, making sure that, uh, you know, restless legs or, or sleep apnea haven't been missed because treating the root problem is better than, than covering it up with a Band-Aid. Um, the um, side effects of the medication, um, uh, again, it, we, if we look in the elderly, uh, the, the, the studies, population studies of, of the elderly on the medication, the, the major concerns are over uh, increased risks of falls and hip fracture. Um, also, uh, patients may become forgetful. Uh, benzodiazepines can, uh, can aggravate memory problems. And uh, they tend to depress mood, so, so we, we try and avoid them where, where uh, possible. Certainly in anxiety disorders, the, there's a need to use them, but if you're using them just for sleep, I often try and find another way. And so I would, I would look for other, other options if at all possible. So that's the whole stack of questions in 45 minutes. Uh, thanks very much.